morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to MindSpeak. Uh, it's a privilege to be hosting uh, Jeremy. Let me just tell you a little bit about Jeremy, first of all, and then some personal thoughts. Jeremy, of course, is the managing director and CEO of, Stand uh, of Barclays Bank, uh, Kenya. Jeremy uh, is a board member of Barclays Bank of Kenya Limited. He's served as chairman of the Kenya Bankers Association. Director, Regional Sales and Performance, Standard Chartered Bank, Head of Consumer Banking in the UAE, Standard Chartered Bank, Executive Director, Head of Consumer Banking, Standard Chartered Bank, and CEO, Standard Chartered Bank, Singapore. He is the Accountable Executive for Barclays Bank Kenya Subsidiaries, Barclays Financial Services, Barclays Bank Insurance Agency, Barclays Microfinance, and Barclays Nominees Limited. He's also a non-executive director for several firms, including ABSA Financial Services, Barclays Life Assurance, First Assurance Limited, and Kenya KEPSA, Kenya Private Sector Alliance. He has won several accolades, among them the Banker Magazine, Bank of the Year in Tanzania 2010, Euro Money, Best Bank in Tanzania 2011, the Banker Magazine, Bank of the Year in Tanzania 2011, EMEA Finance, Best Foreign Bank in Tanzania in 2012. The youngest board director in the company's history. He's a member of the Young President's Organization, Aspen Global Leadership Institute Fellow, Fellow of African Leadership Institute, East Africa Chapter, Fellow of the Aspen Leadership Institute, Aspen, Colorado, and USA non-executive board member of AIDS Business Coalition, Tanzania. This is what I found interesting. He has an MBA finance from McGill University, University and a bachelor's degree in pharmacy from the University of Manchester. So it's a journey from pharmacology to banking. And I've got a couple of stories I've got to tell before, we t before I hand over to Jeremy. So we've been talking for a while, and I've been telling him I've got to get you on MindSpeak, and one thing and another, it hadn't happened, and I was dropping my daughter off in Durham. And as I'm checking into the hotel, I look up, and there's Jeremy. And I said to Jeremy, when, when you want things to, uh, to, to happen, I believe things happen, and you find people, it's, some people call it serendipity, and it was indeed very serendipitous to meet Jeremy miles away in Durham, where we were both dropping off our daughters. Jeremy is a champion, was a champion, is a champion swimmer, 50 meters breaststroke and 50 meters uh, freestyle. But unfortunately, Jeremy, you were saying you would have gone to the Olympics, but in those days, the funds weren't found for the Olympics, Kenyan Olympic swimming team. So that was, that was something else to consider. And in the, in the times I've met Jeremy, he's really interesting and he's got a fantastic fresh perspective which he's going to share with us all today um, about where Africa is, where Barclays is, and his philosophy around, uh, around, the, around the business and his personal philosophy. So, Jeremy Awori, it's a sincere pleasure to be hosting you today after a very long time of asking. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ali Khan. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I think Ali Khan has already done my presentation for me, so I'm feeling I'm not sure quite what I'm left to tell you, but um, I think it's an honor to be here in front of you. Uh, and, and what I thought I would do today is just literally share my journey and some of the things um, that I've experienced along the way, and then talk a little bit about the, the banking sector, both internationally as well as uh, regionally and uh, here in Kenya, and then try and weave into that some of the things I think as leaders we have to deal with in this, in this new world. And that's why you see the title of the presentation is actually VUCA, and I'm sure a number of you would be familiar with, with that. And that really is an acronym for me around volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, and I think now more than any other time, all those factors are coming in to play at the same time. And, and that really creates a situation where leaders are under a different kind of pressure to perform in a world that is changing at such a rapid rate. 
but we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, what I thought I would do, what, what this is, is this is just a pictorial representation of um, the winding journey of, uh, of mine up to this point. Um, I'm a Kenyan, born here in Kenya, grew up uh, here in Kenya to, I think, two amazing parents. My mother is English um, and my father is Kenyan. And when I think about their journey and I think about, say, the, the choice my mother had to make in those days, which was in the 60s, to move out to Africa to follow a man who she's going to marry in those days, yeah, it was quite a choice. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it going the other way, you're living in UK, comfortable life, father not very excited about his daughter moving to another, to another continent with this African man. Um, so I, it's almost like that's where the journey started with, with me. I mean, I was fortunate to be born of them. Um, I have two other siblings. Um, a sister and a brother who is uh, mentally handicapped. And, and, and I think that, that, that just growing up in that environment um, gives, gives me a different perspective around just dealing with issues that a lot of people don't think about. Yeah, you know, when you're growing up uh, you know, with, with a wonderful family, but you've got you know, a brother who's challenged in his own ways and people not knowing how to react to him because he doesn't talk. Yeah? but he's very gentle and very enthusiastic. So all of a sudden you get this boy come running up to you and you want to say hi and he's hugging you and he's doing all his things, but you don't know how to respond because he cannot talk. And just seeing people saying things about him um, that some you like, some you don't like, and how you deal with that is, was also interesting and to, to the point where it became subconscious. Um, also growing up in a, in a mixed race marriage has its own issues, yeah, you know, and to me those are all positive issues. They're not. They're not negative issues. People come and say, how did you cope with it? I didn't really cope with it. It was just my world and my view of the world. Um, and I was very fortunate in the sense that, um, you know, my parents never made a big deal out of it. They never talked about it. We never talked about color. We never talked about race, religion, any of that. We were just people and we respected that within our family. And I think that came out to me very clearly, actually, at the recent launch of uh, my uncle's book, Riding on a Tiger where we, we actually, it came clear that, you know, as a family, um, we're actually almost a mini United Nations. Yeah, you know, I mean, <laughs> my, my, on my dad's side, there were 17 children from one mother. Yeah. So I, I, I would almost ask him, how, how does that work? Yeah. In, 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 in real terms. Yeah. I'm trying to imagine, it's not the dining table setup that you normally have to start. Yeah. You've got such a gap, you know, the oldest versus the youngest, yeah, is, is, is uh, something else. But when, when we look at that and we look at where they came from and where they are right now, and you think around, you know, we've got people we've married into Scottish, English, Liberian, American, people are all over the world. And in there, I think, is a strength and, and, and a benefit which makes us very tolerant and understanding of other cultures and other ways of doing things. And I think that helps children just adopt that philosophy. And one of the things that I really value and appreciate is if we could have more of that in this world, things like tribalism, racism just disappear and become you know, less of an issue. So I was very fortunate to be born in that environment. Um, and as a family, I guess stra straight from my grandfather who was a, a, a canon, he had very high expectations very high standards, and that flew through into his kids. Uh, I mean, my dad was, um, was, was that like, a, he, he spent his career in a multinational working for Unilever, um, here and also internationally, and had very high standards, but was very humble. I mean, when I think about his life for a moment and how it impacted me, he, he was a person who did something like four or five degrees. You know, we're thinking we, we achieved something when we've done one degree, yeah. He says, by the way, I was doing three degrees at the same time, yeah. That was in the 60s. This was before the West Indies and all of those people from Caribbean had descended on the UK. So black people were quite rare at that time in the, in the UK, yeah? Um, and he managed to do that, he managed to achieve that. Um, and then rose to be president of the Student Union in University College London. 
which, which when you think in those days, for people to be willing to, to accept somebody from outside into their universities, you know, was quite something. And he, was, he would never speak about it, and that's something that I really learned about in terms of humility and just focusing on doing what is right and being professional in what you do. So I was fortunate on that side. My mother on the other side was a, or is a lawyer um, and has been focused on, on her career and making sure she got the balance between looking after us as kids and her career. Um, and I think that had a big, big influence. And one, one of the things they, they did, I mean, I went to school at St. Mary's School here in Nairobi. And again, without knowing it, as many of you know, St. Mary's School was run by Catholic fathers. So we were indoctrinated as Catholics. Um, every day, assembly, yeah. Hail Mary's every day, yeah. Sometimes twice a day, yeah. You know, so. But on a serious note, it was one of those where the discipline of those fathers and their love to do the right thing for us as kids, yeah stood out and it made a difference to many of the people who are senior leaders now and I, you know and I think the challenge is is our schools doing that now or are they just employees discharging a job as opposed to growing future leaders and growing future responsible citizens so I think St. Mary's really had a you know a big impact on on me um, because it was a school where you had all sorts of people you had people who um, were very well off um, and then you had people who were not. But it didn't really matter. That was the interesting thing. We never really felt it. Whereas today you feel it more. You know, and I, you know, it, the materialism of it comes through every day. Um, so I think St. Mary's really had a big, a big influence on, on me. Um, the other thing that really shaped my life, I think, as a, as a young person growing up was, I was first, of, first and foremost, extremely shy. You cannot imagine how shy I, I could be at, at a young age. I think my parents were like, this boy has no chance, really. Yeah, I mean, he cannot. Uh... <laughs> you know when you're small and you run behind your mother and you want to get inside her dress because you don't want anyone to see her? That's, that, that's what uh, I was uh, like. Uh, there's no way I could speak in public. Yeah, that was not going to be even conceivable. Um, you know, so, so I guess the thing that I did is I got into sports. Um, and got into swimming from, from fairly young age, about seven, eight or nine, my parents gave me a lot of support, going to the first swimming gala, second, and then I guess they figured I was okay, so they encouraged me on the training side, and um, I managed to get to the point where I was swimming for Kenya from, I think, about the age of nine. So, so it was um, one of those experiences where, you know, when everybody else is going and relaxing or going home and playing their games, we'd be off to the swimming pool to train in the evenings. Um, and, and it really transformed my life in the sense of, first it, the thing about sports is that it zero rises everything else. It doesn't matter about your background, it doesn't matter about your race, your size, it, it doesn't really matter. When you get onto that starting block, it's you against your peers doing your sport. Yeah, you know, so what you put in, you get out. Yeah, so I, I think it taught me a lot. It gave me confidence as I started winning and, and, and aspiring to, to do the best that I could do and breaking Kenyan records and then wanting those Kenyan records to stay a long time, um, you know, really built, built up my confidence. Um, and I think that then moved on and I continued to swim for Kenya for the next, whatever, 10, 15 years after, you know, after that. And it took me abroad to different countries. I remember going to, um, to South Africa. And those are the times of apartheid and you could not even get the stamp in your passport. If you remember, if you get your stamp in the passport, you are not allowed back into Kenya. Yeah? So you make sure your, your passport is not stamped, otherwise you will be staying that side. Yeah? <laughs> so, and, and it was very interesting because that's where I became aware of these things like race. You know, you're suddenly there, you realize that you're swimming against other teams like Zimbabwe. I was swimming now at that point when it was still Rhodesia, yeah? Um, and it would be all white teams. Nothing wrong with white, but they were just all white. There was no African participant in those teams, no person of color in those teams. And it was very just interesting because when we actually swam against them, sometimes they won, but sometimes we won. And just their whole view of what? Black people are not supposed to do this, yeah? This is not, this is not a sport that you know, maybe athletics, there's other things, but 
swimming is, uh, was not something that they were expecting this to happen. So, so it, it, but, but at the same time, you got to see some of these realities uh, around there and being tolerant. Because when we would go on these trips, we had to stay with other people. So you can imagine somebody who's small, young, painfully shy, thrust into somebody else's family environment. You're not staying in hotels, by the way. You'd go and stay with other people. You don't know the rules of their house. You don't know how they operate, whether they're nice, whether they will accept you, whether they won't accept you. But you're in that environment. Yeah? So it teaches you a lot without you even knowing that you're, that you're learning things like that. So for me, I take a lot. I talk about swimming because I take a lot out of it. I mean, I was fortunate. It took me, as I was saying to Ali Khan, uh, to qualify for the, for the Olympic Games, Commonwealth Games. But as I say, at those times, it was a bit unfair. You train for four years, and then you're told you're on the team. But two weeks before you go, you're told, by the way, we're not taking a team. Yeah? And you've been training for four years to get that goal. It's pretty hard to, to have to, to, to swallow. But I was fortunate. I went to other, place, other things, World Student Games, uh, All Africa Games twice. Um, you know, and I got those great experiences of, you know, when you walk out into a stadium representing your country, there is no better feeling than that, by the way. If you've got 60, 80,000 people in a stadium and you're there because of your country and everybody is there because of their country, there's another level of respect. You all know you've put in the work to get there, yeah? And that, that there's no one there by flukes, yeah? There's nobody there by accident. And you'll have winners and you'll have losers, that's part of it. But, um, so I, I, I took a lot out of that. So I did my swimming. I reached the point that, that I felt if I needed my swimming to move to another level, I had to leave the country. So I got a scholarship to go to the UK. And that's reflected on that journey there. And that took me to the UK, where I saw a different level of competition, a different level of facilities, a different level of training. Um, and again, a different cultural experience. You know, when you're thrust into a different environment, you, you know, you, 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 you think now, you're far from home. Your parents are not there. You know, when you're here, your parents are just a few kilometers away, probably. When you're a whole ocean away, and the flights are not as frequent as they are now, yeah, you're pretty much on your own. Yeah, you know, so that was interesting. Then I did my degree, as, um, as Ali Khan mentioned, uh, at University of Manchester. He was asking, why, why pharmacy? Which was, an, which was an interesting one. You know, I came from, my, my dad was an engineer. Um, among other things. So it was either science or science, yeah? <laughs> it was not, uh... so if I said I wanted to be a musician, that's the fastest way for me to give him heart failure, yeah? So, <laughs> so I couldn't, I didn't think that I had what it took to be a doctor. My mother told me promptly I didn't read enough to be a lawyer. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to cope with the amount of reading, so that was off the table. Architecture, not really. So I like the choice between medicine, business, yeah, management. So I ended up in pharmacy, and it was very kind to me, very tough as a course, qualified, um, and then worked as a pharmacist yeah, in the UK. And that gave me a lot of experience around, I guess, human interaction um, and seeing people. I worked in very, very um, rough neighborhoods right across the UK. Um, so most people don't think of pharmacy in the way that maybe I experienced it. You know, if you work in rough neighborhoods, you see the extremes of drug addiction, um, you know, and, and, and the impact things like drugs can have on good people. You know, when you're, when you're dishing out methadone to somebody who's trying to get off their addiction, and you see a core good person behind there, but they've gone wrong somewhere, yeah? And that has had a major impact on their life. And sometimes you see it ending completely badly where somebody loses their life because of their addiction. Um, so it gives you a level of humility and also a level of appreciation that you, you should not take life casually, yeah? And you need to be very careful about your choices, yeah? Because one wrong turn and you can end up in a, in a completely different space. So I did that for a while and then decided I wanted to go and do an MBA because I wanted to just give myself more options. So I, when I saved enough money through my, my work to pay for my MBA, I, I had a choice. Do I do it at University of Manchester? easy option. I'm in Manchester. I'm used to Manchester. Then I thought it's good to just do something entirely different. So I just picked Canada. Off I went to McGill. Completely new environment. Um, new challenge. And it was, again, best thing I've ever done. That gave me a different exposure, uh, you know, again, to Canada and that whole world. And it opened me up to finance. 
And then I, when, I, when I finished my, my degree, I came back on holiday really to get a break on my way back to the UK. And uh, I met a person called Tony Grog, who was at that time the CEO of Standard Chartered Bank here. And he was the surgeon tasked with fixing Standard Standard at that time was almost to the point where it was going to close. It had, it had so many bad loans, it was running out of capital. Um, and this was an interesting man. He was an oil man running a bank. He had never run a bank. Yeah? But he was extremely tough and he knew what his job was, was to save this bank. Yeah? He was not there to make friends, as he said. He said, I'm not here for friendship. I'm here to save this organization and I will do what it takes. And I ended up working in his office, um, doing various things. And he then entrusted me, moved me into the retail bank. And I, and I was asking him, why, do you, why, why is it you want to hire me? I know nothing about banking, truth be told. Yeah, I've come from a different industry. But the industries are very similar. They're highly controlled industries. Yeah, if you think about it, when you're dealing with controlled substances in pharmacy, you have very, very strict rules around how you manage those, those, uh, those medicines. Uh, the same with banking. It's highly, highly controlled around how you deal with money, processes, etc. So that moved me into banking, and I was, I was very fortunate to to move into the operations department where we were centralizing the whole of the banking network across the country. We were the first bank at the time to do that. Um, and I, I, was, I was fortunate in the sense that I was working for two people who had like 25 years experience. And I was, I was given the job to be their boss, which was very daunting. You've got people who have got 25 years of hardcore experience and you basically have like one or two. Yeah, but they taught me so much. I was very open to learn from them um, because I didn't pretend that I knew it. I was much younger. They were much more experienced in life, not to mention banking. And to this day, I can still call them if I want to get some technical advice on something just because they had that experience. And I moved on um, through a number of other jobs. Um, and I remember getting this call one day. I was running service quality and I was running the branch network in terms of a regional branch manager. And the CEO of the time, a man called Mr. Les Gibson, he called me up to the office. Yeah, um, and I got my books and, you know, so what does he want? CEO is calling me up to, to see him and he didn't, he didn't call you up to see him very often. So I was like, what has gone wrong now here? This is, this is not going to be good. So he said, Jeremy, have a seat. Yeah. So I was like, now really ready, pen in hand, book open to, to, to start writing what it was that, uh, that, that he was going to tell me. <laughs> He so, said, so how are you, Jeremy? Fine. I was, like, and I was like, this must be really bad yeah, for him to be asking me this. Yeah? And he asked me at that point in time, he said, do you want to, uh, you know, we've, we've thought about this and we want you to be head of retail banking for, for Kenya. You know that one where you're just looking at somebody and you're just wondering, what have I heard? Everything goes now into slow motion. I felt like somebody had dropped a piano on top of me yeah, in the sense of the responsibilities of running a business like this. And remember, I was 28 years old. Yeah? I was not... This was pretty much unheard of in this, in this uh, country at that time. Most of the people doing those jobs were 50 plus yeah, and had worked all this time. So I had to deal with th that issue of, of course, I was excited. I was, it was trepidation. Can I do it? Will I do it? What if I fail? All of those things go through your mind. I'm coming being promoted within my peers. Will they accept me? How do I manage them? There were all those issues that you have to kind of deal with. And as a young person, it wasn't, it wasn't that easy to deal with them. But I found a way to deal with them. I read a lot around how to try and manage those type of situations and they, they supported me through that process. Um, and it was interesting because at that time, Barclays was like the number one bank. Um, so it was our mission to become the number one bank, a stand chart, yeah? So that was what we were fighting for. So that was towards the late 90s uh, and I did that job for uh, three, four years. And literally, just as we left, that was when we passed and Stanchart became the biggest, most profitable bank. Yeah? So we had grown the bank quite significantly through that process. It was now out of the woods financially. Um, and then when it sort of came career-wise to, to look at um, now what next, the group CEO of Stanchart at the time was visiting. Um, I was a young, feisty uh, Kenyan boy who was like asking, so where are the careers in Standard Chartered Bank? Yeah, where, where to next? Is it only Africa for Africans? Or are there opportunities elsewhere? Yeah, because I said, can you please show me the Africans who are senior in the bank, i.e. not on attachment, yeah? <laughs> not on a return ticket, yeah? You know, so uh, 
Uh, because I said, why should I stay? Yeah? I, wasn't, I was not schooled in necessarily how to maybe interact with the group CEO yeah, at that time. You know, people were like, you can't say that. You can think it, but don't say it. Yeah? <laughs> so anyway, I'm, I asked him and we had that conversation because I was like, if you can't give people those opportunities outside of this world, of, of, of Africa, then you're never going to keep the best talent. And why can't we have Africans being global CEOs? Yeah, it doesn't have to be we restrict ourselves to our markets. Um, and he was a very sort of courageous, very progressive guy. Um, and the next thing, he took me through a whole bunch of experiences that I thought were more coincidental, but led ultimately to a job opportunity. You know, they came in and said the head of consumer banking in UAE is opening. That time it was the fourth biggest business for Standard Chartered globally. So I said, you know what? I discussed with my wife at the time. We said, shall I just apply? I was like, why not? I've done well in my job here. I want to go out. It's a different experience. Through the hat. I said, what's the worst? They can say no. Yeah. At best, I can get an interview and a free trip to Dubai um, <laughs> for, for their process. Yeah. So, so um, in it went. The interviews happened. And then they called and said, you know, you've got the job. That's when another moment now dawns on you that you're into a different league, yeah? That business in UAE was bigger than the Africa business, yeah, at, at, at the time. Very different business. Again, didn't necessarily have the direct experience to run that, but from a leadership perspective, again, working through people, um, took up that challenge. Um, it, was a, it was a fantastic experience for me because it took me to a place I never had a plan to go. It was never in my life's journey to say, I want to go and work in the Middle East. Um, so culturally, I learned a lot. And I was fortunate to be there at a time where um, so many things were going on. Dubai was essentially built uh, to what you see now at the time when I was there. I mean, if you think about Burj Khalifa, tallest building in the world, when I was there, it was sand. Yeah, there was nothing there. So I saw them literally build it. Dubai Mall not, wasn't there. Yeah, all, all, a lot of what the creek and all of those investments, they were only opening property investment up at that point in time. And I learned a few things. I learned that if you have the ambition you can f and you can execute it, even five years is a short space of time. You know, we think about five years like it's, it's a long time or six years or, s or seven years. I'm, and I'm, I saw them build all this stuff. And I, and I think quite often, our challenge is, is we don't have big enough aspirations and big enough ambitions. I think we fear and we run back and we lower our standard, which I think holds back our continent and our country. So I was fortunate I did that job. We again did really well, tripled the business in terms of its size, and I was given a regional job covering 23 countries, which took me from Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, um, whole of Middle East, the whole of Africa. I was going to Pakistan when bombs were going off regularly, by the way. Yeah, and, and it was very real. I remember going there on one trip, and when I was there, they actually blew up one of the hotels where people were staying. Yeah? So it's not, it's not like abstract. So that's a country where, at that time, with what was going on, you always had your passport with you and US dollars in your pocket. Yeah? You didn't leave them in your hotel in the safe because you didn't know now, at any point, yeah, what, was going to, what was going to happen. So it was an interesting experience. Again, gave me that, that regional experience. Um, and then did that, and then... They asked, they said, look, we want you to be CEO in one of the markets. They gave me a few offers. I didn't want to take up those. Eventually, they, they said, look, go to Tanzania. The, the Africa CEO came in and said, we've got this great job we think should be good for you. I said, yeah, CEO of Tanzania. And again, I looked at him and said, a Kenyan going to Tanzania? Sure. Yeah, you, you're quite sure about this, this, this dynamic? He said, absolutely. Um, and again, another fantastic experience. I mean, Tanzania was really great, great people. Uh, difficult business environment, but again, managed to do, managed to have those experiences. And then, then came the opportunity where I wanted to come back home because my kids um, had lived abroad for most of their lives. So I was like, I had a job offer in UAE, and then I had this opportunity to come back to Kenya. So it was literally, my kids kept on asking me every day, are we, Barclays was talking to me, Stan Chart said, we want you to go back and do another regional job in Dubai. Which way are we going? So they were like, Dad, have you decided? Is it Dubai or is it Kenya? Dubai, Ke every day, yeah? So eventually you took that decision to say, look, I want to come back home so that they can also get that experience and I can contribute to, to Kenya and to Africa rather than being part of the Middle East story. And that's what brought me to, to, to Barclays and uh, my journey here. And I think that, again, has been equally exciting. Um, it was one of those career choices where I could have said I'll stay in Standard Chartered and maybe have been a few kilometers down the road 
in, in a similar job here, but Barclays offered a different opportunity, which was it had far more that I thought it needed to fix. It was a far more challenging job. Um, and at, by that time, it had really fallen a little bit behind in terms of its performance from being a very strong number one where other players had come up. So that was the excitement of that challenge to come and see, can we turn it around and, uh, and, and grow this business? So that, that was uh, really part of uh, my, my, proper, my proper career journey. Along the way, I um, spent time doing various entrepreneurial endeavors uh, from, from a very young age, whether it was 10 years old, deciding that I wanted to become a farmer and farm chickens to literally being a DJ in the, US, in the UK and having an events organizing business. So Caroline here knows the pain that I give her whenever we do events, yeah, about every single detail that you have to go through when you're doing, when you're doing events. I'm, so I, I was just fortunate to have had that journey. 